Hello, today is March 11th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts. This interview is a part of the Morse Institute Library's Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our videographer today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. And today we welcome Ruth Harriet Jacobs to our program. Welcome, Ruth. It's nice to be here. Thank you. May I ask you a few questions? Please. Uh, when you were born? I was born November 15th, 1924. And where were you born? I was born in Boston. And did you grow up in Boston? Yes, I grew up in Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan, and there were very different then than they are now. In what way? Well, in those days there were many Jewish people who lived in that area and an assortment of other kinds of people. And then uh, now the area is largely African American and uh, in other ways it has changed too. And. What is your marital status? I am divorced. And do you have children? I had three children. Uh, one died young as a baby. And I have two wonderful children now in their 50s. And do you have grandchildren? No, I don't. Tell us a little bit about your family background. Where did you graduate from high school? And what was your parents' background? My parents, none of, nobody in my family went to college. My grandparents on both sides were immigrants from Europe. My mother came here actually when she was four years old. And my father worked as a salesman in Feline's department store. And my mother at, died when she was very young at age 32 when I was 10. And my brother was three. And my father was unable to take care of us. And my grandparents, uh, maternal grandparents, took care of us. And they lived in Dorchester. Actually, when my mother was alive, we had lived in Mattapan and in Roxbury. And um, I did not go to college at the normal age. I went to Roxbury Memorial High School. And because I was an orphan and my grandparents had no money, they assumed I would have to go to work right after high school. There was no talk of scholarships or anything to me. And I was put in the commercial course at the high school? In high school, learned how to do shorthand and typing, which were very useful when I became a reporter. And in high school, uh, I was very fortunate because one teacher did see that I had some scholarly ability and managed to get me into an English class that was not in the commercial track, but was in the college track. And uh, my English teacher encouraged me that I was a good writer. And one of uh, the other people in that class and I became co-editors of the yearbook. And um, I also wrote for the college paper. And when I graduated, I had a series of horrible clerical jobs, all of which I hated. But my friend from high school who had gone on to college, was in a journalism course at Boston University. And she called me one day to tell me that since all the copy boys had gone off to war, newspapers in those days hired Harvard graduates as copy boys as a way of the men breaking into the newspaper business. But all these guys had gone off to the war, and they were hiring girls for the first time. So on my lunch hour from this horrible clerical job, I ran up to the Herald Traveler and got interviewed, and they hired me. And I started at uh, 6.30 AM the next morning and was a copy girl for one year. But during that year, I wrote a lot of feature articles. And even though I was very young. I did have some writing talent. I know it's um, funny to 
speak well of myself, but I could write. I always could write. And when you say young, how old were you? I was 18. I was 17 when I was hired as a copy girl. And I was 18 uh, when the editors discovered that because I was being paid as a copy girl, they had to pay me by the inch for my feature stories. And they discovered I was making more than the beginning reporters. So at age 18, they made me a reporter. And in fact, I was very young looking and pretty in those days. And one of the places I covered was the State House. And uh, Governor Tobin, uh, who was uh, later worked in the federal administration. And I would say Tobin Bridge is named after him yeah. in Boston. Said to me, I said to the paper, they're sending children to cover me. <laughs> and uh, I covered City Hall, Mayor Curley, who people have heard of. Uh, I covered him. What was he like? Uh, he was quite charming, <laughs> uh, colorful man. And he had his bad things. He went to prison. But the people in Boston loved him so much that after he got out of prison, they elected him mayor again. again. And he, he had a bag man. We all knew who the bag man was. Now, what was that? They took the graft. Mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I found him very colorful and interesting. And I got to interview, uh, cover federal elections. I covered um, Dewey's. Uh, attempt to become president, and I uh, covered uh, Harry Truman's. Now, when you say you covered them, was that in the Boston area, or did you travel? I was often traveled. I was sent to uh, conventions, and I had a very good career as a newspaper woman. Were you ever intimidated by, for instance, the Tobins and the Curleys and the uh, presidential I couldn't afford candidates? to be. I, uh, I was an aggressive kid. And I got a lot of gratification out of my work, and I loved my work. Now, what years were these? I started in 1943 as a copy girl. So at that time, war was happening. Were you interested in what was happening with the war? Oh, certainly I was mm -hmm. interested. When I was in high school in my senior year, Pearl Harbor happened. And we were going to put on the Mikado, the play, the Honorable Gentleman of Japan and all. And the high school would not let us put on the play because everybody was angry at Japan for Pearl Harbor. And I, I knew about the war. And in fact, in my high school history class, I had written a paper on the futility of war. I was afraid that war was happening, going to happen. and. Uh, I, I wrote about how futile war is, and everything I saw in World War II confirmed my hate of war, and I've been a pacifist ever since. And being a pacifist in your youth, um, was that difficult? Because I know in interviewing many of our veterans, during that era, many of them felt like they couldn't wait to get out of school because it was their duty to go. And well, it was a go. popular war, World War II, and, um, but still it was a horrible war, and I saw the casualties. My, one of my assignments, uh, which lasted for a very long time, was to meet the boats that came into Commonwealth Pier. In those days, they did not have the huge planes that would that now ferry troops around the world. The men who were wounded or who had, were being discharged as veterans came home on these huge boats that docked at Commonwealth Pier in Boston. And I was sent by the paper t daily, or almost daily, to greet these boats and to write stories about the men who were landing. And it was interesting because I was probably the most kissed woman in World War II because when these guys, the healthy ones, got off the boat, and they were the first ones to come off that could walk on their own, uh, I was the only young woman on the dock. There were some older women 
from the Red Cross, and there were men there, but uh, reporters from the other papers. But I was a pretty young girl, and all these guys would come down the gang plan and kiss me. Probably the first woman, American woman, that they had seen well, in a few years. Well, except for the nurses, because mm -hmm. in those days women did not serve in the military except as nurses. And so um, after the those who could walk off could came off, then they would carry the wounded down in stretchers, and they would put the stretchers in trains, hospital trains that were waiting there. And there would be three layers of stretches all the way down the trains. And I would walk through those trains seeing people, men, who were horribly wounded. Do you remember what your feeling was initially, the shock of it, or? Yes, it was a terrible shock to see these young men in terrible situations. Many of them were, of course, very pale. Uh, they had wounds. Some of them were missing limbs. Uh, some of them were in tears, uh, glad to be home, but still in shock at what had happened to them. And I would walk down kissing these men and getting their stories, interviewing them. And many of their stories were published in the paper. Uh, where they had served, what had happened to them, what their feelings were. And I can still see those men. I can, uh, all these years later, and I'm 83 now. And also, uh, I had another horrible thing, um, and that was that before I, one of my first assignments in the paper when I first became a regular reporter was to write the obituaries of men who had been killed in the war. And the military would send us at the newspaper lists of the killed, of the casualties, and with the home phone numbers and addresses of these people. And uh, from Massachusetts, from, which was the area for the Boston Traveler, and it was my job to go to the phone and call the families and get the information for obituaries. And often, we got the list before the families had been notified because the military would send somebody to the family's home, but they couldn't always find people or they didn't have enough people to send. And many, many times, I would be the one that would have to break the news to families that their son had been killed. And the first time uh, the that ever happened, do you remember? I remember being absolutely heartbroken, not only for them, but just hating the fact that I had to be the bringer of bad news. And all I could say to people was, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know you didn't know. Please uh, forgive me. And sometimes they were too grief stricken to give me the information I needed for the obituary. And I had to call them back, you know, wait a half hour. But I had to call them because I had to get the obituary. And the families did want the obituary in the paper. And Often, they couldn't even tell me when the service was going to be because they didn't know they yet. They didn't know, sure. But some people did already know, and it was a lot easier to make those calls. But the strange thing is that for my speaking now, I travel a lot around the state of Massachusetts. I speak in elderly housing all over the state uh, as I've become a gerontologist. And when I hear the names of towns, or I see the signs entering such and such a town, what comes to my mind after all these years is, yes, I did an obituary. On a on young a, soldier who from came that town. from that town. So sometimes I hate to hear the town names of different towns in Massachusetts because it brings back those memories. How long were you on that assignment to do the obituaries? 
Do you remember approximately? Only approximately for a year because as I got more skilled as a reporter, they had new people coming in. That was the obituary was kind of considered a beginning experience that anybody could do. But as I got more skilled and I got to cover national elections and uh, interview people like Winston Churchill came to Massachusetts. He stayed at the Ritz Carlton Hotel in Boston. And you got to interview Churchill? I got Winston to interview Churchill. him. Were you with others while that interview oh, was yeah. going on? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, did you all have to sort of fight for your question? Do you remember any of that specifically? There weren't that many newspapers in Boston. It was, you know, just a handful of us. and. He was very good about answering questions. He almost ex asphyxiated me because I was sitting very close to him and he was smoking one of his terrible cigars. But um, fortunately, I, I said I didn't have to do the obituaries through the whole war. When you were interviewing some, in, some famous individuals such as Churchill. Mm -hmm. Prior to the interview, were you given help in doing research or did you? No, that was my job. Mm -hmm. And I should tell you that um, after my uh, started on the paper, I started college also. I worked days for the traveler and I went to college at night, went to Boston University and I took courses that would help me. I took history courses and political science courses. Uh, and I, so I was getting educated and also I knew how to read and the Boston Public Library was a tremendous help to me. And how, did you end up getting a degree eventually? Yes, not then. I accumulated about a year's worth of college credit by taking courses at night because I couldn't go full-time because I had a full-time job. And I also had some responsibilities. I was living with my elderly grandparents and had to help there. Anyway, uh, I, what was your question? Quite frankly, I don't know, but we'll uh, move on, yeah. won't we? Um, I, I um, you were going to school, you mentioned. Oh, you asked me if I eventually got a degree. Degree, I'm sorry. Well, yes. what happened was I left the Herald Traveler after I got married because I had a problem pregnancy. And my doctor suggested, as they did in those days, that I not work, that I stay at home. And, and what year was that? Do you remember? Uh, it was 1949. So before we get into... I got into married in 1948. And before we get into that, let's yeah. talk a little bit about during the war and um, some information that might be helpful also when people watch this tape. You did a lot of interviewing of some of the soldiers, you said. Yes. You were a strong... And veterans. And veterans. And you were a strong-willed young woman. Yeah. Do any of the stories, any of the interviews stand out in your mind, one or two more than any others, and would you like to share those with us? Well, I'm, uh, I have a clipping here of a man who won the Silver Star, and he put his own life at risk to save uh, a number of his fellow servicemen. And I will never forget him, his courage, that he was ready to sacrifice his life. And others told me, frankly, and I didn't, wasn't popular to say it then, that they hated having to kill, that they were not brought up to kill, and they hated the fact that they had to kill people and they felt badly about it and they can remember the faces. And what they were having had no name then. Now we call it post-traumatic syndrome. And it was not then identified as something. And these men did not have to face, when they got home, any condemnation. They were heroes. 
and everybody saluted them and was proud of them and loved them. And it was very different from the Vietnam War. I was very active against the Vietnam War, you know, in protests and the things people did. And there, when the men came home, they were often not considered heroes. They were considered to have been um, bad to kill Vietnamese people. There was definitely a difference with it regards to... It was a stigma, to, yeah. yes. But when, it was very different in World War II. And so people... What happened in World War II was very interesting. The men came home, they had the GI Bill, and a lot of them went to college. And in fact, by then I was a college professor um, in the Vietnam War, and some of them went, and they were very different groups of veterans when they, uh, about their feelings about themselves, pride or lack of pride. But um, the World War II veterans, a lot of them got jobs immediately. The women left the workforce, most of them, and the men got the jobs that became what we call the cult of domesticity with women going back to the home. And I wrote a whole feature series with another reporter during the war that the women were planning to do this. They were not planning to continue to work except for a small professional group, a minority. Most of them wanted to go home, wanted to raise children, wanted the husband to be the breadwinner, etc. And the guys became the breadwinners. Some went to college, as I said. Some got jobs. And they were honored for having fought in the war. But then when they got old, now, now, and the last years that they're old, a lot of them are having post-traumatic stress. They're not busy with their families anymore. They're not busy with their work. They have time to retire. And many of them are now going to the veterans looking for help because they are now feeling delayed guilt about the people they killed and wounded. Do you the think Germans, any of the that Italians. has anything to do with the fact that after many, many years, they've been put in the spotlight because of some of the movies that have come out, some of the books like Tom Brokaw's book. The Greatest Generation stuff, yeah. But it's not just, I don't think it's because they've been put in the spotlight. I think it's for the first time they've had time to reflect. And in old age, I'm a gerontologist, you understand. I later got my doctorate and so on. And I've written nine books in the field of aging, so I know what aging people are like, and I'm one myself. Now they have time to think. In an old age, you often sum up your life. You assess what you've done. And in old age, they are now feeling guilty about the people they had to kill in World War II and remembering that. And they're seeking help, many of them, from the Veterans Administration, and they can't get it because the Ve Veterans Administration isn't able to even take care of the veterans of the war now in Iraq. War, right. And um, so a lot of them are going through a lot of late life grief because of what they had to do in World War II, even though then it was a popular war. And I might add, many, many of our veterans who have interviewed with us from World War II stated uh, that when they got home, they didn't talk about it, they went right back to work, they, they moved on. And now, just now, in the past 10 or so yeah. years, they're starting to talk about it. And perhaps, as you said, that's why there might be a little more yes. discussion and more guilt and more issues yeah. about it. I did, uh, uh, fairly recently, went to a group of veterans who had been prisoners of war in World War II. And now, in their old age, they're dealing with this experience where they went to work, they had families, they were busy, they brushed it aside. Now, the memories are coming back. 
it's true sometimes with older people, they can't, we can't remember if we brushed our teeth this morning, but we remember what happened when we were 20 years old. Quite the long-term memory is stronger than short-term memory. Now you mentioned that you um, went back to school. Well, so when I went back to school was when my children went to school. When my children were in school, I started at Boston University. I had a year's worth of credits from having gone, taken some night courses while I was working in the newspaper. So I had to do three years of undergraduate work at Boston University. And my intent was to become a high school teacher because then I could teach while my kids were in school. And um, I majored in education, but I also majored in the social sciences. And I got captivated by sociology. And when I got my bachelor's, I decided to go on and get a graduate degree, thinking I'd get a master's in sociology. And I started at Brandeis University, which kindly gave me a fellowship. Uh, and I was age um, 40 when I got my bachelor's. And at 40, I started Brandeis. And I was encouraged to continue on to the PhD. And instead of becoming a high school teacher, I became a college professor. And although my PhD is in sociology, I specialized in gerontology. I had a great interest in older people for various reasons. And while I was in graduate school, I published a number of papers on aging and as I, I've written nine books since then, uh, my most popular is Be an Outrageous Older Woman, and one that was published last year is ABC's for Seniors, uh, Advice from an Outrageous Gerontologist, and that's for men and women. And anyway, um, I uh, worked at Boston University for 13 years as a professor so and you graduated from Brandeis and yeah. went back to BU as a professor. Yeah, yeah, for 13 years. And then Clark University in Worcester invited me to come in as chair of its sociology department. So I went to Clark, and I only stayed there for five years. Um, I decided to leave Clark for various reasons. And uh, then I taught at Regis College, and I'm still teaching there, but not for money. I taught in the regular program at Regis, which is a wonderful women's college, or was, and now it's co-ed. But now they have a lifetime learning program for senior citizens, and I teach in that. And to pay Brandeis back for my fellowship, I teach free in the lifetime learning program at Brandeis, and in both places, I'm teaching creative writing and many of the people in my class, uh, the men, were in World War II. And uh, some of them have written about it. One of them, who is a very famous uh, restaurateur, uh, he started um, Legal Seafoods, and he, that whole chain, wonderful chain of stores, and he's not writing about legal seafoods in my class. He's writing about his service in World War II. Fascinating. Yeah. And uh, another guy, I have had other people in the class who've made interesting careers for themselves, had interesting lives, but now they're old and they're writing about their service experience. About the past. The yeah. past. That they remember so vividly. Yes, yes. And as a way of coming to grips with what they had to do. Getting back to your earlier years, and you talk about having to be paid as a reporter instead of the copy girl. Do you remember what your pay was? <laughs> I made $28 a week when I started as a reporter. In those days, and it's in my story, of my series that we wrote about um, what women were planning to do after World War was o Two was over, uh, we, when we surveyed them, of course, we asked how much they were making. 
And I was rereading those articles before I came to do this interview, and I was shocked myself to discover that many of them were making $20 a week. That's all they were making. Some were making less. 30 was a huge salary in those days. It was very different times financially. Now, when you, when you were the reporter, you said you were living with your grandparents. Yeah, and my brother. And your brother. And did you pay your grandparents' oh, rent? Oh, yes, yeah. Out of the $28 that I was making as a reporter, I gave my grandmother part of my check every month to help her with the rent and with feeding my brother. My brother was seven years younger than I was. He was still in high school then. Did you ever feel, because you had mentioned your, your mother passing away at an early age, that you were almost the surrogate mother with your brother? Or oh, was yes. that the grandmother's? No, position? I felt very much as if I was his uh, mm -hmm. mo surrogate mother. What was your house? We, we also like to get a sense of the surroundings. What was your, were you in an apartment or in a home? In Dorchester, was famous in those days and still is for three decades. So there would be a family, it would be a wooden, old wooden house with front and back porches. They're all very much along the same stuff. Oh, and we lived on the middle floor of these. And the rents were cheap, and you had to pay for your own heat. Uh, you had a coal furnace, and you had to buy coal and shovel the coal. Uh, life was not easy. And do you remember, was there sort of a standard uniform or clothing that you wore during that time, go going to work? For instance, it's so common nowadays for women to wear slacks or pants. And we didn't wear pants in those days. Uh, women just didn't. It wasn't considered appropriate. And I had very little clothes because I had very little money. And when um, I actually, we were on something called a AFDC, Aid for Dependent Children. children. And once a year, I would walk a very long distance to a distribution point where we would be given some clothes, maybe a skirt and a blouse. And that was all I had as a kid in high school. And um, when I got into the newspaper business and I had to present myself, I would I got a few things. I had very little clothes. Um, it was not possible to have more. And being in the news business, did you hear more about what was going on in the war? Oh yes, we heard more of course because we, uh, when I was a copy girl, I was, knew everything that was going on because what copy girls did in those days was you tore the copy off the machines from the Associated Press and the United Press. There was a room with these machines that would spew forth everything that the Associated Press and United Press were putting out, a lot of it about the war. And my job, the editors sat in a horseshoe circle, and my job was to know which editor to give which stories to. And um, often I had time to take a quick look at them. So often you saw it even before the newspaper people oh, yeah. themselves or the yeah. editors saw. Right, right. Do you remember about food rationing? Oh, I remember shortages? it very well. That uh, we had uh, we had coupons, and my grandmother had the coupons for our family, and she would do what she could to get them. And of course, in those days. Butter was shot. You couldn't have butter, so you would buy this white, horrible looking stuff with a little round ball that would break that had yellow coloring in it. And that was how you made butter. And I never went hungry. I was very thin then. I didn't eat much. I'm much heavier now. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was enough you could eat, but 
there wasn't a lot of meat. There was practically no meat, and other things were shot, and people filled up on bread. So you weren't hungry, you had bread. Did you, you put, did you take a lunch to work? I, I did not because I didn't want to deprive my grandparents and my brother of food at home. And I would uh, get a little something, some fruit. I, in those days, there was a chain of restaurants in Boston called Waldorf. And it was uh, cheap food, like the fast food places now, even cheaper. And I would buy a baked potato or something like that that would fill me up. And the truth is, when I got to be a front page reporter, I got to cover a lot of conferences. There was a hotel called the Hotel Statler, very near the Herald Traveler, and all the major conferences were held there. Plus all the celebrities stayed at the Ritz-Carlton, and you could, I could walk to both of them. And I covered a lot of these luncheon meetings where I got excellent food in these hotels. And also, to advertise, some of the hotels would send food over to the newsroom so that we, we'd mention it. The Hotel Statler made a wonderful ice cream pie, and they would send them a bunch of them over to the newsroom. And um, I was, you know, so we, we ate well in the newsroom, and often people would bring in donuts and stuff like that. And uh, I was also very lucky because a lot of celebrities came to the newsroom. John, I met John F. Kennedy. What was that like? That was, he was not then running for president. He was a rep. He was a simply a representative in Congress at that point. So he was fairly young at that he time. He was young, and he came into the newspaper looking for publicity. And I got to talk to him and to other famous people that would come into the newspaper uh, to, um, for publicity. In those days, they didn't have so many publicity agents as they do now in teams. Uh, they did a lot of their own legwork. Prior to setting up this meeting, I believe you had mentioned in conversation about uh, meeting with General Eisenhower. When General Eisenhower returned to the United States after World War II, he flew into this country and he came into Logan, uh, I believe he came into Bedford Airport, which was then a military airport. And uh, by then I was, I have to admit, one of the top reporters and I was sent to there. And he got off the plane and uh, he shook hands with us, and it wasn't me, but his wife was, had come to meet him at the plane. And somebody, one of the reporters, a photographer, yelled, Kiss your wife, because they wanted a picture of his wife kissing him and greeting. And he said to the group, to the guy, you mind your business and I'll mind my own business. And he didn't kiss his wife. And later it came out that while he was in Europe, he had an extended affair with a woman. I and believe it was his driver, yes, if, if my yes. history tells me correctly. Oh, you know a lot, yes. yes. And so that might have been why his wife was not rushing up to kiss him, because mm -hmm. <laughs> word had got out. When you were working or at home, did you have to participate in any blackouts? Yeah, there were blackouts, and um, you had to be careful and so on. And I had to go to the paper at odd hours. I worked days, but that meant starting at 6 a.m., and I didn't have a car, of course, so I would have to take the streetcar. And I lived quite near the streetcar, but I had to cross the major streets, so I had to be careful. And then with the streetcar, if it was dark, would they have shields for their lights, or do you remember? I anything? don't really remember mm -hmm. that. But uh, Did you or your grandmother have a victory garden? We didn't have a yard where we could have a garden. Some people did. Some people had yards where they could grow vegetables. Did you remember? And of course, in those days, you know, people didn't eat as 
the variety of vegetables and fruits we do now because now they're flown in from Florida and California and in those days you ate more local stuff and you only had tomatoes during the summer. Mm -hmm. What about war bonds? Do you remember any of the war bonds? I bond remember drugs? having my uh, salary deducted even though it was a very small salary. I had a few dollars a week put into war bonds and um, most people did that could afford to. It sounds like you had quite a busy life. What about um, establishing more friendships or having any kind of fun activities, going to the movies? Did you ever have time to do well, that? Well, a lot of people, uh, I hate to say this, but their recreation was after their shift was over at the Herald Traveler and in other newspapers, there was a particular bar uh, where people went. It wasn't a nightclub, it was a bar, and they drank. People did drink a fair amount, and I never got into that. For one thing, I couldn't afford it. I was giving money to my grandmother, uh, paying for my brother's driving lessons, you know, various things. And uh, for another, I just never uh, enjoyed or believed in drinking. Uh, and what I did for recreation was I was going to school uh, at night and enjoying that very much. And I used to bike. Uh, I, we lived very near Franklin Park, which is a big park in Dorchester, in Roxbury. And I would bike uh, in the park. I didn't own a bike. I couldn't afford it. But you could rent a bike for 25 cents an hour in those days. So you would rent a bike, you would take um, the T yeah. or the uh, trains. Um, yeah. What did you do after you left the Herald? You, somewhere in there you met your husband? No, I met him when I was still on the paper. On the paper, and then you... I got married in 1948. 48. In 1949, I had a problem pregnancy and was advised by the doctor to leave the paper, and I did. And I did some freelance writing uh, a little bit for the paper, and also I wrote some children's stuff and various other things. And uh, I had the three children, and I stayed home till the youngest went to school. And then I went to school, got the bachelor's at mm. 40 and the doctorate at 45. And I've been teaching ever since in one way or another, and writing. I have a column in the Senior Times, which is distributed in Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, and Maine. I keep busy. And uh, I do try to do what I can to work against war. I became a Quaker at age 60. I was born Jewish, I still consider myself Jewish, and the way you become a Quaker is you write a letter asking to become a member of the meeting. And when I wrote my letter, I said I still want to be Jewish ethnically, it's a tradition. You don't resign from a people that went through the Holocaust. But the reason I needed to become a Quaker was because I had worked with Quakers in the peace movement. The American Sociological Association set up a anti-war committee during the Vietnamese War, and I was um, appointed to that committee. And uh, there were two Quakers on that committee, one Elise Bolding, who now lives in uh, Needham at um, North Hill, very prominent anti-war person she's written. And I hung out with other people uh, in the anti-Vietnam War uh, demonstrations, and many of them were Quakers. And then I received the desire to become a Quaker because we are pacifist anti-war. And I work, I'm on the peace committee for my Quaker meeting. Back in the 60s, when you became more of an activist, how did your children feel about that? 
Uh, I think my children are reasonably proud of me. In fact, when I went looking for clippings to give you about my writing in World War II when I was on The Traveler, I discovered that my daughter had put these in a uh, in plastic for me. As and keepsakes. She, as keepsakes, but she had also done a little research when she was in high school uh, or college and had gone back and read these and sort of did something modern on women's issues using that. And uh, I think uh, both of my children are hoping that we won't have any more wars. And I'm very sad at 83 that we are involved in this long war in Iraq and see no, some people see no way out, uh, and the war in Afghanistan. And it breaks my heart I, to hear about the casualties. It's, uh, it's now 4,000 Americans who have been killed plus all the people we have killed. And the 4,000 that have been killed of Americans are just in Iraq, plus the ones that have been killed in Afghanistan, plus all those that have been wounded and can't get the good care they should be getting from the VA. It's just disgusting to hear people aren't getting the care they need. They've been, you've read about the scandals in the VA and uh, I had hoped when the, because um, after World War I, the League of Nations was formed, and that didn't work. But at the end of World War II, many of us were very hopeful when the United Nations was formed, and we thought there would not be any more wars. And I hate the thought that I, my life is ending soon, um, that I go at a time when there are so many wars and when there's no end in sight. I don't have grandchildren, but most of my friends have grandchildren. And they worry about the future of the world with these wars. And just, uh, we're doing this taping in March of 2008, and they have just finally confirmed with research from the University of California that the guys and women who in the first uh, war in, um, against Iraq, that shot war, really were poisoned by the drugs they were made to take, by the gas, by uh, the, the insecticides, etc. And a lot of times they were saying these guys were just psychological or whatever, uh, weaklings. No, they were hurt. And we are going to have a whole generation of, and a lot of the homeless, you know, not all of them, but many homeless are Iraq war veterans who never did fit back in. Uh, I make sandwiches. This, in Waltham, there's a place called Bristol Lodge which is a day place where the homeless can hang out. And um, I, through my Quaker meeting, a bunch of us, we make sandwiches, and I make each sandwich weighs about a pound. I put so much in them. I put in uh, ham for protein and cheese for calcium and uh, lettuce, of course, and then little, I put it, little cherry tomatoes in with the sandwiches, you know on top, loose. Uh, and these the are package. for the homeless individuals? And these are for the homeless at the Bristol Lodge mm -hmm. in Waltham. And it's the least we can do is we should be taking care of these Vietnam veterans. There should be housing for them. They shouldn't be out in the streets. And I'm, you asked me how my children feel. I'm very proud of my daughter because my daughter works for mass rehab, and she has worked there a long time and decides who can get um, disability. And she got this idea, it was her idea, nobody assigned her, to go to Long Island Shelter for the Homeless, and she finds 
people who are eligible for disability that are homeless and she is if they are genuinely disabled, which a lot of them are mentally or physically, is able to get them on disability. Not that they're going to become rich, but they're going to be able to rent a room someplace or a little place to live, and they'll have medical coverage too. So, you know, she cares. she's a caring person, and she got an award from the uh, governor for doing this. So I have tried uh, to influence my students and my children to work against war in whatever calling they can find or to help the casualties of war because I saw the horrors even in World War II and certainly the wars since then have been terrible. As we finish this interview, Ruth, is there anything else, a memory or any other comments that you would like to make to those who will be watching this interview? I would like to say that join us who want wars to stop in whatever way you can. Uh, do what you can to work for peace because it is just terrible to contemplate that the wars become more and more lethal and to contemplate the possibility of nuclear war. And each of us should be doing what we can to make people respect other people, no matter what their nation, no matter what their color. Uh, and to not use war as a way of solution and not to have our country be militaristic as it is now and the one to stop was. Well, Ruth Harriet Jacobs, we want to thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. to do this for us. We and thank you it. for what you're doing in this project.